All right, hello everyone and welcome to an episode actually of Handmade Ray. We are trying to test uh, using 1080p 60 today. I'll, well, I guess it's really 1080p 30 today, but it's the 1080p part. We, we had had trouble with 1080 uh, before. It was only capturing in 1080i and we'd been wanting to figure out what, that was, what was going on with that. I went over uh, the settings and stuff and went around with uh, Blackmagic on uh, this a few times. It turns out the card was bad. I've switched to a, a different one of the same card, just a different card. Uh, and now we have 1080p uh, 60 capture, which means 1080p, I'm sorry, 1080p 30 uh, streaming should be working because it should be capturing in 1080p and then just streaming every other frame. Um, so hopefully that's okay. We're testing it today. I'm not doing an actual episode of Handmade Error because I don't want to risk losing one um, with an untrusted sort of streaming setup. So here we go. Uh, we're just going to be doing some random handmade ray programming. As you know, handmade ray is our little ray tracer I built one time. It's what we use when we're testing. People had requested uh, a long time ago that I build a ray tracer, uh, and so I did. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got it to the point where it's actually relatively functional. It just doesn't have um, a couple of things that we would probably want to do if you were really playing around with a ray tracer, and so we can add another one of those. Uh, today. So here it is. It's it's handmade right here. I'm going to open up uh, for coder and I'm going to go ahead and load uh, the project file for that and build it. Uh, and you can see that if we take a look at the build.bat, we're actually building this in optimized mode. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that makes sense, right? Because in optimized mode, we get a lot better performance and this is a performance oriented uh, thing so it makes sense that we want to mostly compile in O2 when we're actually running it because otherwise we'd be sitting around uh, waiting a lot longer for it to produce uh, images. Now in the build.bat it automatically runs the ray tracer as well. Uh, we may want to change that while we're doing some active development because we may want to run it in the debugger or who knows what else. Um, but at the moment I'll, I'll let that go ahead and do it. So what happens here is when we run it it's programmed to dump the output uh, I believe into the data directory. Uh, and you can see we've got sort of our, our images here. And it's right now set up just to produce this one image. Uh, it's not a particularly interesting image. At some point we should probably try to make an image that's better. And maybe we'll do that a little later today. Uh, but basically here is a, you know, it's a pretty finely detailed image as you can kind of see. Uh, if I go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit here. Uh, I don't know if I, uh, where's the zoom view actual size. There we go. Uh, you can see that it's pretty smooth now too with that many samples we get pretty smooth uh, output and so on uh, But you know it still takes a fair lo fairly long amount of time to do a really smooth rendering with it Even though we're uh, multi-threaded now and uh, I believe we actually print out here. You can see uh, we print out How long it takes to actually do something that image takes about 46 seconds uh, at a really really high sampling rate now You can do much quicker by just uh, lowering the sampling rate quite a bit, but I actually want to leave that um, sampling rate pretty high because uh, what I'd like to do today is maybe work on a little bit more performance optimization. Uh, just so we have a pretty solid understanding of how we're doing um, our performance and, and just generally what's going on with it, right? Okay. Uh, so if we switch back to the code, you can kind of see here how it works. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, really all we do is we create a bunch of tiles uh, that are sort of tiling the image and we put them into uh, basically a you know a, a queue and then we have uh, worker threads that come through and take those tiles out of the queue and they run this function that's all they do right they just take this function they go through look they say <clears throat> I'm gonna take a work order out of the queue uh, this work order is just a tile it says where I should render I loop through and I do however many rays per pixel I've been told to do by the configuration settings um, which at, like uh, it says up here, 10, uh, 1024 uh, rays per pixel. And you can see here it's 64 by 64 tiles, obviously. Uh, we sort of played around with that to see which, which tile setting would be the best. I think that was roughly where the breaking point was. Um, and so, you know, that's all this really does. And if you take a look here at what we're doing, I'm going to move it to the other screen so that it's not um, where my, my head is there. If you take a look at what's going on here, uh, we're just sort of looping over all of the pixels and for every pixel uh, we're doing a bunch of, of ray tests here where we just take the ray index uh, and we you know loop over the rays per pixel pick a location in the pixel to cast a ray from cast the ray out see what we hit and if we hit anything uh, that's an actual surface we just keep bouncing around right 
Uh, and that's really all we do. Uh, that's it. We don't have anything else. And uh, right now we only really have two primitive types as well. Uh, you can see us looping over them here. There's the planes, there's the spheres. Uh, and that's, that's it. That's all we're doing. So there's kind of two areas of optimization we can look into here. One of them, uh, I think we don't really have any real reason to go into yet. Uh, and that is a bounding volume hierarchy. A bounding volume hierarchy is something that allows us to not test every primitive every time. Uh, you can see here we're testing every plane and every sphere every time we do array. And that's actually absolutely fine if the number of primitives is very low. Because anything we introduce that would be a bounding volume hierarchy here, if the number of primitives is very low, we're actually just going to slow the ray tracer down. Because it has to do work to traverse the bounding hierarchy. And the only time that becomes work worth doing is when we have, you know, 100 elements or something, 1,000 elements, 10,000 elements, starting to push that element count up high enough uh, that the work done to partition them into a bounding volume hierarchy and traverse that bounding hi volume hierarchy, uh, that that actually becomes a payoff by eliminating a large number of primitives from consideration. In our case, the amount of time it takes uh, to consider these primitives is probably so low that anything we were going to do with a bounding volume hierarchy uh, is going to be more work. Because you can see here we've only got like five spheres and one plane, right? Uh, and so when we want to start creating a more complex scene of some kind, that's the time to start looking at an optimization for a bounding volume hierarchy. Uh, right now we don't have that, uh, and so we really don't want to be looking at that. So what we're going to do today is look a little bit more at perhaps using some better math operations here. Uh, and what I'd like to do first is just take a look at the assembly code that's actually being executed to get a feel for exactly how bad it is even before looking at wide operations. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, the debugger and I'm going to load handmade right into the debugger so I can see what that disassembly looks like. Uh, now. We're opening Visual Studio, which itself takes about as long to open as it does for our thing to, to cast like 8 billion rays. That's just, you know, uh, Microsoft quality engineering at work. I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up that, that ray here. Uh, and this is, the, this is the ray program itself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to step into that render tile function. And I'm going to just take a look roughly at what uh, the loop, this loop here, um, which is our most expensive loop, right? It's getting executed. Uh, 1,024 times, a tremendous number of times, every pixel, right? So this is this is the real hotspot here. Uh, it's doing just most of the work. And so this is the part of the program uh, where we really need to find out what's going on and how to make it faster. And so, again, before I start anything else out, I just want to get some sense of what's going on, right? So we can see a number of things right off the bat uh, that I really don't like. Uh, like all I've done is even just flip the disassembly and already we're in trouble. Uh, you can see here that when we are uh, trying to produce our uh, random sort of uh, location inside the pixel to cast a ray from, rather than inlining uh, something convenient for generating a random number, we are actually doing a literal call out to rand. And I really don't like a literal call out to rand because as you can see, um, well, I guess you can't see because apparently the C runtime library source code isn't installed on this machine. Um, uh, but I don't really care because I don't need it. Okay, there we go. Uh, so anyway, uh, as you can see here, the source code to this actually involves a lot of, of, of business. I jumped into the call here. We're now calling to some kind of a CRT internal uh, function. I don't care about this. Uh, to receive per thread data. Uh, this is the per thread data because I assume it wants the SRAND RAND sequence to be uh, maintained differently for every thread, right? Uh, so here we go. We're calling into all this stuff. Look, I mean, look at how many look at how many calls we are deep. We haven't even done any work to generate our random uh, number yet. Look, look at where I am, right? I mean, look at this. this is a disaster. We can't be having this kind of thing happen in our inner loop. It's absolutely unconscionable and, and completely. Um, unacceptable. So, you know, uh, why this is, people always ask me why I don't like using the C runtime library. This is why. Most of the functions don't do what I need them to do, right? It's not a knock on the people who implemented the library. It may be that that was how it had to be implemented per the spec or who knows what, but for our purposes, that's already totally unacceptable. Uh, so let me go ahead and let's start um, a little to-do list here. 
so I know um, exactly what's going on uh, that we found that we have to replace. Uh, so we definitely want to do that. We definitely want to switch to a custom RAND. There's no question about that. Uh, let's go through and, and take a look at what happens after that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a go to disassembly here. Uh, so, so that's unacceptable, uh, and we need to make sure that doesn't happen. Let's see what other sorts of things we're doing here. A lot of these are uh, single, uh, they're, they're SIMD instructions, the SSE instructions, uh, but they're not actually using the full width, right? Uh, this is still doing single scalar uh, at a time, which is fine. That's what we expect it to be doing. These all look like reasonable instructions for what it's supposed to be doing. I don't have a problem with any of that. Uh, we do, of course, have uh, a few issues, like I was saying before, where we want to um, we want to do wide on these probably eventually, but that's sort of a, a separate thing uh, that what I'm looking at right now. I just want to look at any stupidity that's going on first. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so you can see here we've got just our sort of our basic um, uh, bounce code looking here. Here's the test to make sure we exit the loop. Everything looks, you know, at a first glance fine there. Uh, just really straightforward stuff happening here. Nothing weird accessing uh, these, these um, primitives and doing tests against them. Uh, all of this looks pretty good. Uh, nothing, nothing too problematic. Um, I'm still happy with basically everything that I'm seeing here. Um, and these are these are the plane intersections. We don't have many of these anyway. Uh, we have very few planes in the world at the moment. Yeah, so I don't know if some of this stuff could be done better. I'd have to go ahead and look um, at it in more detail, but I don't see, like, I'm just looking for obvious real bad situations uh, and I'm not seeing anything too problematic here. <clears throat> It seems to have, I think it may have unrolled this loop a few times. I'm not sure, it looks like it did. You can see we're seeing the same thing uh, multiple times here. Like for example, right, like here is uh, <clears throat> some of the plane equation stuff. And here it is again. I don't know if it just reordered it. I'm not sure exactly what it did there. Uh, I'm trying to find the sphere stuff. Here's the sphere stuff here. Uh, again, looks pretty good. Um, Let's see, it inlined the square root, which is great. Um, that's really good because we don't want it to, oops, I don't know what that did. What is that button? I don't know what a lot of these um, new Visual Studio features are. I, like I have never seen this button before. I don't know what it does. Uh, anyway, uh, so that all looks pretty good. Um, So really, I mean, besides the fact that we want to do this wide, I'm really just not seeing too much stupid here. So the compiler, I feel like, did a pretty good job of a first pass um, attempt at, uh, at making this stuff work. And it looks like really our biggest culprit in terms of, of stupid things we want to really get rid of are just these RAND calls here. And that's fine because we can totally do that. Um, <clears throat> that is not a, a huge problem. Uh, uh, now here we've got our power call. Uh, that's going to do, uh, again, that's an unnecessary call. We would rather have it do uh, just the inline sort of um, expansion, series expansion to compute power. Uh, but, you know, it's actually okay because that's really at the very end, right? Um, that's the end of the loop there, and that's going to get called almost never. Uh, so if we take a look back, for example, at where that POWF is being called there, um, it's in this extract uh, linear to sRGB uh, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, let me go ahead and uh, here. Uh, you can see here real sRGB color or whatever. And then we have a typo. Um, this right here... Uh, extract linear, linear to sRGB. Uh, this is only happening when we finally go to write out a pixel to the to the BMP. So although that is an unnecessary call, and if that were in the fast path, um, like in the uh, in the I should say the hot path, 
we would want to get rid of it. I don't think we have to in this case because it's, you know, it's doing 10,024 10, of these loops before it ever has to execute one of these. This is probably just never going to amount to uh, any appreciable difference in speed for us. So it looks like our first big culprit is RAND. So before we do anything else, I'm going to go ahead and replace RAND uh, with something more sane than RAND. Now that's a little bit tricky because you have to know some number theory to do it. Uh, and I don't. But uh, the good news is there's a lot of people who've written on this and we can find them now. I, uh, we do have sort of a little bit of a dilemma here. Um, and I'll show you what it is. Um, So uh, I rather like this uh, random number generator. It's uh, made by uh, a person named uh, Melissa O'Neill, I believe. Yeah, uh, she is a professor at um, Harvey Mudd University, who I don't think even works on random numbers or anything like that uh, as part of her research topic. But I think she, like many people who like things to be done well, uh, I kind of got the sense from reading the paper, it, it, like... I don't really remember the specifics of the whole paper, but I kind of got the sense when I was reading it that maybe she needed to use random numbers for something she was doing and was kind of unhappy with the state of how things were uh, and look, decided to look into it and ended up finding some really good stuff. Now, if we take a look at this um, paper as soon as I find it here, there it is, paper. Uh, if we take a look at this paper, it's a really easy paper to read, and I highly recommend everyone read it. It's written very well. Uh, it's not one of these math papers uh, that you have to have a degree in mathematics to read anyway. Uh, it's actually written in plain English and designed for people who don't necessarily already know what she's talking about to eventually understand it, uh, which is great. There may be some sections where she's talking about things that are harder for you to understand because you're not in the field or whatever, but you know most of the parts that you care about in here, it's a long paper, it's very well explained, um, are actually really easy to read. And, and I, it's, a, it's a great uh, first paper on random numbers anyway. Uh, you, could, you could just start here and, and uh, be pretty happy with it. So I highly recommend reading this. Now, the thing that I was gonna say is, these are the kinds of random number generators that I like the most currently um, because they're awesome for basically everything except for one thing, uh, which is that in uh, SSE instructions are not the best instruction set to implement them. So if we were just doing single, if we weren't planning on doing SSE optimization, uh, I would say we would absolutely want to use these. Uh, they, I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't immediately use these. Because we are using SIMD, I've never really, so far, I haven't looked into what the better uh, way to go is, like whether you can adapt these at all in a good way to SIMD that, that still has uh, what needs to happen in them. I don't know, but let me go ahead and scroll to the part that I'm um, most uh, caring about here so I can show you. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so here is the, the problem. Uh, if you take a look at how these often work, uh, this tends to be the uh, this tends to be the sort of structure that these take. Um, and the idea here behind these random number generators that I you know, like I said, I highly recommend reading the paper because on Handmade Ray we don't go into detail a lot on all of the topics like we do on Handmade Hero. But uh, basically, what she found when she was looking at these things was that. Linear congruential generators, which is just a very fancy word for adding, you know, multiplying, adding, and modding uh, things. You can see, uh, let me see here. If I can show you. Um, sorry, not modding. Uh, adding and multiplying. Um, usually modding as well, but here. Uh, so it's basically something that just looks like this. It's like you're going to generate a new number by multiplying the old number by something, adding something, and then modding by something else, right? Um, that is generally what these look like. Uh, they're called linear congruential generators, uh, and they typically are what's used in a very simple and quick random number generator because, as you can see, they're very straightforward. This part, the mod part, if you're trying to be extremely fast, is often replaced by something that's not even a modulus. Maybe you just do a modulus by a power of two, so you can use an AND instruction, for example, and then you're just talking about a multiply and add and an AND, and that's a very fast way to generate a random number. Problem is, they generate really poor random numbers. That's why people don't usually use them. 
Uh, and what you can see here in the paper actually, um, well, I guess that actually had a diagram right there. I don't know why I said, uh, what you can see probably is that if you look, here we go. Uh, if you look at what these things generate uh, in various ways that you could graph them, uh, you can see that you end up with things that aren't really all that random. They have very clear defining features in them uh, that you can perceive. And that's a problem, especially you know in game development, uh, where you're trying to create visually random looking things, you can see here uh, you end up getting stuff uh, that can have really bad uh, side effects, right? Um, you know, all of these sort of things, like like here's a, a, a uh, example, right? Um, this is like as good as maybe you're going to get with a linear congruential generator or something, and it still has these really obvious patterns in it, right? And that, I think, is just a... a, a an artifact of the modulus way that they work, they're always going to have at some visible uh, sort of uh, stride, they're going to have a sort of a coherent um, pattern that emerges. Uh, and what you're looking for is something more like this if you're trying to get a white noise generator, uh, which is what a random number generator is generally supposed to do. Um, you're supposed to be looking at something that looks like that, not something that looks like this. This is not uh, what you're looking for, right? Uh, well, anyway, uh, what uh, Miss O'Neill did here was she uh, was working on figuring out a way to quickly generate um, random numbers that would have comparable speeds to something like uh, a linear concurrential generator, uh, but that wouldn't have sort of the obvious drawbacks, right? That wouldn't look like so bad there. Uh, and what she came up with was the fact that if you were to look at how the bits were distributed, uh, it turns out that you can mix uh, the, uh, the bits of a linear congruential generator if you shift them around, you can mix them together in a way that produces something that actually is much, much more random, right? Uh, and uh, I don't know where the final graphs are. I'd have to look more carefully uh, at the thing, but she ends up getting stuff that, that passes essentially... Uh, all of the kinds of randomness tests that you might throw at it, uh, she ends up getting that out of a very, very simple thing, which is essentially that equation I showed you before where it just does uh, a shift uh, and uses basically bits from the linear congruentially generated value um, to, you know, sorry, I don't know my way around the paper that much. Okay, here we go. Yeah, back where I was. So this right here is the linear congruential generation part. You can see uh, state equals state times multiplier plus increment. And then here is the part that she's sort of uh, found is the important part, which is that you need to shift the state uh, by a value that is itself coming from the state, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, the problem that we have here is that the, the shift that you're doing here, while a shift like this one is fine because this shift uh, is by a constant value. The shift here is by a variable, right? And so what that means is in order to shift this value uh, to get the proper output value you're trying to achieve, what you'd need to do first is you would need to find out what value was in state already, get that into something in the processor that allows you to do your shift and shift by it. That's fine in x64, uh, normal general purpose registers, they do have a shift by a register amount. However, uh, at least I believe they do. I don't know that I think about it. I almost never use anything like that. Uh, but SIMD doesn't is the problem. There is no shift by something other than an immediate uh, in the SSEs that we normally use. So if we go to the Intel Intrinsics Guide, for example, uh, and we look at, for example, we normally target SSC2 or SSC3, uh, but really anything in the SSC family here, I believe, like basically anything uh, in here. If we take a look at a, um, uh, a shift left operation, uh, so if you take a look at, at, at uh, the 128 wide folks here, you can see that all of the 128 um, uh, wide ones here, actually, Wait, what's this guy? Those are 16s. 
Am I just totally wrong about this? I'm so sure you can't do this. She factored by count, and count comes from... Oh, okay. No, never mind. I, I was just double checking. So yeah, you can't do it, right? Um, you, you can get a count out of this variable as a single count, but you can't get it out of, uh, of each individual lane, right? So I believe I still am right. Never mind. Uh, for a minute there, I was like, "Wait, what? How, when? What? How, what am I? What am I seeing here?" There's been many times when I've wanted to do that and I couldn't do it, but it, it's not the case. So it looks like, right? You you can see here, uh, your the the value that you're shifting can be four lane wide, thirty two bit, right? Um, but unfortunately, the shift itself only comes from the bottom bits of this uh, it doesn't come from the lanes what you'd want to see is a j right uh, or an i showing up in this count expression here um, so that it would shift by a different amount per lane but of course it you, you can't actually get that right so effectively what this means is that you have to downshift to scalar effectively in order to do your shifts. So you would like to do four wide random number stuff, but instead you can only do one wide because the shift is, you can't have four different shift values in four different lanes, right? Uh, and I guess that's because, I, you know, far be it for me, because I don't really know the hardware design limitations here. I assume that's because the shifter for all these lanes is taking the same value. So like, you know, the, the register comes in and it can just shift the whole register by that amount and then it redivides it up into lanes or something, right? So it doesn't have the ability to shift each part individually. As far as it's concerned, that's four different shifts and it can only shift the whole register. So I'm assuming that there is no such circuitry for doing it that way. Now, at some point, I feel like they may have added, I don't remember, but somewhere way up the chain here, I feel like they may have included a shift that can actually do variable per lane at some point. I don't really remember. But the point is nothing on the tar on the platforms we target unfortunately has that. So that's the real issue that we run into um, with these permuted congruential generators is just that in this case, it's really hard to make uh, a random number function like this work uh, because when we go to implement it, we have this problem um, of just the instruction set not really supporting the thing that we want to do. Um, but for now, let's start with it and then we'll see what we can do uh, as we go forwards. Uh, so let's take a look at one of the ones she suggests here, uh, which is, I believe she recommends using XOR shift. Uh, let me see here. Here we go. Um, so you can see some specific implementations here right? Uh, and you can see 32-bit output 64-bit state is probably what we would want to use because we know we don't need more than 32 bits of output. We're using floating point values. Floating point values can't store more than 32 bits uh, worth of variability anyway in them, right? They're 24-bit uh, <clears throat> mantissa only. So if we take a look at this, uh, a 32-bit output with 64-bit state is probably mostly what we want. Uh, and what you can see here is that she recommends basically saying, uh, excuse me, uh, using uh, XOR shift every time uh, and then just applying this. XOR shift is an existing random number generator. Uh, and then applying this every time uh, in order to uh, get the correct mixing, right? And again, you can see here how bad this is uh, on the SIMI side of things. You can see that you're trying to pr perform a rotate um, which SSC doesn't do, that's okay. You can do a rotate in a couple instructions, right? You just you just have to, or to batch the things together. Uh, so program your rotate here, uh, and the amount you're rotating by, again, is comes from the state itself. So although here and here, your shifts are constant amounts, so those are shifts that are easy to accomplish, this shift is not, because this shift right here 
uh, for the Rotate 32 is a shift that's entirely coming uh, from the value itself. Uh, so that's obviously a problem as well. Uh, but anyway, if we take a look here at, at uh, applying XR shift, uh, we can see what that actually is. So if we look at the equation for XR shift, uh, here we have it. So here's what XR shift looks like. Uh, XR shift is literally just these operations. You can see that nothing in here would be problematic for us. All an XR shift is to do its random number uh, update is it says whatever the input was, I'm gonna uh, do exclusive ORs with various shifts of the bits. Those shifts are all constant. So this entire thing would be totally fine um, to use uh, like basically in SIMD, right? Uh, and it's just the part that improves the value that isn't. So one thing that we could consider doing, for example, is just not using the PCG part of it and see how far we can get with just an XR shift. Um, but again, like, you know, uh, it's gonna have artifacts in it and whether those artifacts matter to us or not, I don't know. Um, but let's take, let's take this as our basis uh, because that way we can maybe then look to uh, a PCG to improve it later on when we need to, and maybe we'll just try to figure out what's going on there. And I haven't looked at this stuff in a long time. And so uh, for all I know, if we went and looked, there may have been some people who've done some good work on how to make a SIMDized version of this that's not too bad. Uh, okay, uh, so if we take uh, an example here of XOR shift, right? Um, the problem with XOR shift, actually, now that I look at it, is this is the 32-bit XOR shift, and I actually wanted the 64-bit XOR shift, uh, it looks like, from what she was talking about uh, before, right? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if there's an XOR shift 64 somewhere here. Yeah, uh, because I would like to know what, uh... yeah, I'm not sure. So I guess maybe it's really just not an issue because I guess it looks like here what she's suggesting. Um, and again, you'll forgive me for not having read, read this paper in a, in a long time. Um, but it looks like all she's suggesting here is actually just use the 32-bit the XOR shift, which maybe there isn't a 64-bit XOR shift, uh, on the high bits and then you just keep going, right? Um, so maybe that's fine. So this one she says is slightly worse statistical performance for slightly greater speed, which may be what we would want anyway. Uh, and you can see that this is a, a sort of a different equation for the output. Version for random shift rather than a random rotation. So that'd be actually good because then we don't have to do the rotate. Implied fixed shift. So this version performs slightly less work. The difference between the two is minor. Uh, and she says this one's probably a better choice. So we say the 32 bit output function, okay. Yeah. So in either case, as far as I can tell, yeah, it's a little ambiguous here just in terms of what the 32-bit, uh, it's not explicitly stated, at least right here, that XR shift is being used exactly what it's being used on, right? Um, but it seems like that's the case with 64 bits of state and the state update would be from the XOR shift. The only weird thing, like I said, is if you take a look at how this is working, I'm just not sure how the state relates exactly to this because it looks like, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it does kind of look like she's actually saying you just keep the 32, the high 32 bits. Uh, I don't know. That looks like what she's saying. Um, so anyway, it looks like we're just talking about this. And I should write this down. Uh, so in this case, if we were going to update the state specifically, uh, it would look something like this, right? Um, and we might want to make this official by saying something like, you know, random series. Uh, but as you can see, essentially all this XOR shift does is exactly as its name implies. Uh, all the XOR shift does is take some random value that you started with. Uh, so however you want to seed it, you can seed it with anything. Uh, and then all it does is it sort of shifts the bits around and XORs them with, with itself. Right? So it's just a bunch of XORs with itself. Uh, and this apparently, again, if you uh, take a look at, at uh, the papers for XOR shift there, uh, this apparently passes some statistical tests and not others, right? So it's not a particularly great one, but it's extremely fast. I mean, if you look at what's happening here, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? It's just three XORs with three shifted values. That's incredibly fast to perform. And what you can sort of see here as well is that these are constant shifts. So if we wanted to do this operation wide in SIMD, uh, we would have no trouble doing so, right? Uh, so that would be pretty easy uh, as well. Now, the only part that we again would have trouble with is now if we wanted to apply the mixing step here where this uh, where this part would be um, applied to the upper parts of the value uh, then you know uh, we've got sort of the, the, the variable shift amount to contend with but at the moment here I'm going to content myself with just trying this random series by itself uh, so we know let's let's run real quick uh, this over here so we can have a be uh, um, a baseline I'm gonna go ahead and run the build, right? Uh, oops. Uh, so this is gonna go ahead and, and do its little, uh, its little uh, bake here so that we can have a timing that we were, uh, sort of have on the books for how fast we were running before we change out uh, the random number generator and again, this should be using, you know, a, a substantial amount of the computing resources of the computer. We should check the uh, performance monitor as well at some point uh, to make sure that we're actually pegging all of our CPUs. We should be, uh, but, you know, just in case we mess something up and actually aren't. Uh, but anyway, this will give us a, a timing that we can then use as a benchmark uh, against replacing the random number generator to see just how much of a difference it makes. Having replaced it, maybe it'll make a lot less than I think. Maybe it'll make... Uh, difference, we'll see. Uh, so anyway, you can see here we've got our performance number. We know that we're 46 seconds there. Um, and we know that we've got a particular per bounce rating here. So there we go. All right. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is instead of, of having RAND in there, uh, I'm going to get rid of that RAND. Uh, you can see we've got a random unilateral and random bilateral. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this random series bit. Um, I'm going to move that up to our H file where we define uh, our structs, and then I'm going to grab this XOR shift part. I'm going to put it right up above here. Uh, and what I want to do is um, I want to replace sort of this this bit right here uh, with our own thing. And you can see we've already got it to do for that. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to take uh, rand max. We know rand max is now just the maximum 32-bit integer, so it's really just 32 max, right? U32 max. Uh, now I don't know if we ever pasted u32 max in here i don't think we did so let's oops didn't mean to do that uh let's grab that out of handmade code i assuming we've got it um i don't know if we do 
We do. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and grab that out of here, uh, and I'm going to put it in here. So there's our U32 max. That's the maximum value that a 32-bit integer can have, uh, and we're going to put that right here. And then what I want to do here is put in our XR shift 32. Uh, and what these things need to do now is they need to take the random series that we're talking about. Now, why do they need to take a random series? Well, as you can see, random numbers come from by having a state variable that gets permuted repeatedly over time. Now, what you may have noticed is the rand function did not ever take anything there, right? The rand function itself didn't take any parameters. So how was it doing it? Well, you saw it when we looked in there, all those calls, it was using thread local storage, which is a way of like grabbing out a specific global variable for whatever thread was calling you. And it was doing a bunch of work to do that. We don't want to do that work. So we're just going to pass in an address that's like, here's where the state variable is for your thread. Look directly at it to avoid all of those calls, right? So that we just have a known location in memory. It could just update immediately and get rid of all of those thread local storage calls that were causing us so much of random overhead that just didn't need to be there, right? So we're going to pass in a random series for all of those. And the random series will get updated as such and we'll return um, a 32-bit value. Uh, that is at least pseudo random at this point, probably better than the random that was in the um, CRT actually, because that was going to be a linear congruential generator, it's probably worse um, than this one was. But uh, then after, if we find we need randomness that's better for seeing artifacts from that or who knows what, uh, then we can try to uh, improve our random numbers by again using permutations there. Because we already started with the random generator, that's the first step of the PCG. So we just need to get that mixing step in there if we wanted to improve it. Uh, so anyway, here's the here's us doing uh, the XOR shift uh, and then dividing by the maximum to give us a, a floating point value random, uh, randomly a random floating point value. And uh, here we don't need to change this at all because this was just working on top of our existing one. Uh, so that's all good. All right. Uh, so now if we want this to work, we just have to follow the compile errors down. Uh, so when we're calling these, these just need to take uh, our random series that we want to operate on. Uh, and that's really it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and I think that should basically do it. Uh, so I now need that random series somewhere. Uh, I don't know if we ever call s rand. I don't think we do. So we never seeded this random number, but that's okay. Uh, so all I'm going to do here where we uh, call render tile uh, with the work queue here, uh, I need these to have access to entropy, right? Uh, and so if you take a look at where we call render tile, um, render tile gets called from our, our, uh, uh, our work threads here. or should, oh, there we go. I'm like, where's the, where's the win32? Uh, you can see our, our render tile gets called here like so. Uh, so what we need to do <clears throat> is we need the state for uh, render tile, you know, we need whatever that state function is there uh, to have some idea of what the random value should be. And what you can see is the work queue, when, when it acts to the work queue, it gets off a work order what I'd like to do is just have the work order itself be it contain the entropy that it needs to use, right? Um, so what I'd like to do here is say, all right, that work order, whatever that thing is uh, that needs to get done, it should have a random series in here uh, that is the you know entropy. So we'll pass along that entropy along with the work order. Uh, so here where we do random series. Uh, we will just take the random series. And in fact, we could even just use the random series that's sitting in the work order. We don't really need it to be that. It could be local to the stack, which might be a little bit more efficient depending on you know how these things uh, work out. I don't really know. Um, but anyway, so if we take this random series here, I'm gonna go ahead and say from the work order, let's get the entropy out of there. Uh, and then that's the one that we'll use, right? Uh, and so what I need to do now is whenever I pack one of those work orders up, uh, those work orders need to include the entropy. You can see us packing the work orders up here using the tiles. Um, and so the order entropy, uh, we need some way here of getting some randomized uh, value, right? 
And right now we don't really have a lot of ways of getting a randomized value, unfortunately. Uh, we would like to have some way of getting it, but we don't really. Uh, and so what we, what we need to do is find some source of entropy that we could actually use uh, to, you know, to produce <clears throat> initially random seeds. Since I don't really want to do that, uh, how should I say this? Since I don't want to deal with that part quite yet, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick with using our existing RAND for now uh, to seed the entropy. And because it's not the same random function as our other one, so they won't basically just produce overlapping random sets. Uh, and then what we'll try to do here is replace this Uh, in fact, I don't really even need to call rand, right? What I could do is just say like tile x times something plus tile y times something, right? Um, for now, something predictable so that our images will come out the same every time. Uh, but eventually, you probably want to replace this with a real entry value, perhaps even one that the user can input here uh, that will somehow do some permutation or something, right? So we, we want to do something more real here, but for the moment, we just made to make sure uh, that these are... are reasonable values. So, uh, in fact, I need to do it this way, random series. There we go. Uh, and I think that's really all we need to do. Uh, the random series needs to be obviously defined before it sees that, since C++ is in order declaration-wise. Um, and so now we need to see whether this produces, uh, you know, usable output, right? Um, we should probably have set the raise per pixel down lower uh, while we're doing our testing here, but that's all right. Uh, so, you know, a couple of different things I want to do. First of all, we can see kind of right off the bat, though, um, that there's uh, there was no obvious problem with our randomness, right? Like, it looks pretty much the same as the other one. I don't see a lot of obvious, like, things that are busted with this one that weren't busted in the other one. So, uh, no huge, uh, no huge deal there. Uh, if we take a look at the total time, however, um, what I think you'll notice is if we compare that run with our existing run, the difference is dramatic, right? So all I did, all I did was replace just that random number function. And you can see we went from having um, uh, 0.000025 milliseconds per, per bounce to 0 0.0009 milliseconds per bounce. Uh, it's over twice as fast. And the total time went from 46 seconds down to 17 seconds, right? Um, so very, very, very trivial thing that I just did, uh, drastic speed up, right? Like way, way, way faster. It's, it's, you know, getting a 2x speed up for just replacing one call to the C runtime library, getting rid of that with our actual function is twice the performance plus, right? Uh, and again, you can see why I did that. It, it was a really simple process and I highly encourage you to do this. Looking at a hot piece of code like that, you should not see any calls in it, right? Like any piece of, of work that's supposed to be as fast as possible should not be calling anything. As soon as there's a call, uh, you've probably made a mistake somewhere. And in this case, we obviously did. We were go calling out to a bunch of heavyweight operations when these need to be lightweight operations inside the hot. Uh, path. Okay, um, so now that that's taken care of, we can look a little bit further and go, okay, well, can we go ahead and extend this uh, to be using more of a SIMDI structure? I don't know how much time I've got left. Um, I think I have over an hour because I think we started at one. Am I wrong about that? Uh, I think we have uh, over an hour, so I think we could make a significant dent in that. Um, so again, let's see if we can increase our performance again just a little bit more here uh, by taking a look at doing uh, our math ops a little bit more efficiently. And now, why am I thinking about that, right? Uh, so the reason I'm thinking about that is, again, uh, I like to guide the optimization to a large extent by looking at what is actually happening in the code uh, because that can tell me where my opportunities lie. And if you just take a quick look down at all of what's happening here, uh, what you can see in this code, just very obviously, right? You don't have to really know very much about assembly language at all. Uh, I'm not an assembly language junkie or anything. 
Uh, what you can see very clearly when you're looking at this code, much like the first time I looked through it, I saw those big, uh, you know, sort of uh, warning signs flashing when I saw those calls. I'm like, why are we calling out something? Uh, so that was the obvious thing to replace here. Much like that, what I see here is just a lot of SS, right? I see a lot of mul SS, add SS, sub SS, right? Uh, everything in here is an SS call. <clears throat> now, what an SS instruction, I shouldn't say call, SS instruction. SS instruction is single scalar, right? And any time we're executing a single scalar instruction, we could be executing something wider than that, right? Um, because a single scalar instruction is telling the, you know, the processor to do a multiplication of one scalar times one other scalar. If we, instead of doing mul SS's, we're doing mul PS's, which is packed scalars, we could be doing four or eight multiplications in that same instruction, right? So in the same amount of time it takes to do this mul SS, we could be multiplying instead of one scalar, four scalars or eight scalars, right? And so what we really want to be able to do here is we want to be able to make uh, this function, this hot path, uh, potentially be able to do a wider set of operations. So instead of testing one ray at a time, test four rays at a time, right? Uh, or instead of testing four rays at a time, test eight rays at a time, okay? Uh, and so that's what we really want to do there. <clears throat> so how would we do this, right? Um, well, if we take a look at this uh, Y min, X min uh, stuff here where we go through, uh, we've got this hot ray index here. What I want to do uh, at first, <clears throat> because this is what's doing the majority of the work, I'm wondering whether I could pull this function out without losing uh, too much uh, speed. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to try um, putting this up here and seeing whether the compiler uh, can handle it okay if I pull it out, right? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this loop here, the ray index part, right? And I'm just going to put it uh, in here. Uh, and this is going to be like, uh, you know, the sample rays or whatever, right? Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pass in, and rays per pixel here is, is uh, these are coming out of here. Um, what I want to do here is just have these be things, all of this stuff can be specified uh, cleanly and clearly, and hopefully everything is, is relatively, uh, yeah, relatively straightforward. I'm just going to let the compiler tell me what the stuff is uh, that we actually need here. Uh, looks like, you know what, can we, can we simplify this a little bit here? So I wonder if this stuff can just be sort of put into something. There's because there's a lot of stuff here that we may need. I don't want a huge passing festival, but at the same time, I don't know exactly how I want those to be pulled out. Um, well, let's keep going this way. I'm just going to actually do it this way and we'll just see what happens. Um, so we've got a random series. Um, we've got a film X and a film Y. So uh, yeah. And I don't know, this may have to be treated carefully because of the fact that I don't want it to think that it has to necessarily reload that guy. We'll have to see how that is. Uh, there may be some issues there. We'll, we'll find out in a second. Uh, half picks width and half picks. Yep, half picks W, half picks H. Uh, we've got film center. Ah, uh, man, there's just too much.
bounces computed is just going to be uh, added in locked here, right? Yeah. Uh, so bounces computed would have to be kind of returned and world. I assume it's just world. So final color, is just the return value here. And I'm pretty sure that this is all we would have to do. Uh, so bounce is computed. Uh, is just going to be stored up in here. And the final color uh, will be put there. And contrib is just a pre-computed idea of how many of these we have, right? Yeah, one over raised per pixel. Uh, so I believe that's really all we need to do there to get this into place. Unfortunately, there's just a lot of things that are getting um, computed there. And so we may need to pass those in as like a struct or something more uh, convenient. But I'm just trying to pull this out into, so that our hot path is as simple as possible and is encapsulated in a single place so it's clear what's going on and can be optimized, right? <clears throat> uh, so if I go ahead and, and paste this in here, uh, again, we might want to make that a little bit more structured, but um, we would just say uh, the final color here <clears throat> bounces computed um, is going to come from there, and the final color is going to come from there as well. Uh, and so really all we have to do here is just say call this caster that we've got here and uh, pass all the stuff that you already computed like so. <clears throat> Somehow we ended up changing back to compiling handmade hero. I'm not sure how. Um, I may have accidentally hit a hotkey. Let's try that again. Go and yeah. <clears throat> all right. Um, so again, all I'm trying to do here is just determine whether or not we lost any appreciable speed. Uh, we know that we were getting o o o o o nine uh, milliseconds per ray before, and we took seventeen seconds. I just want to see how much worse it gets. Um, so you can see we do lose a little bit of speed having it there. Uh, so the first question is, well, why are we losing that speed? Um, part of it may just be because of not knowing a few things like the random series, for example, not knowing it, that a few of these things are localized. Um, so it's hard for me to necessarily say exactly where, that's, uh, where that loss is coming from. What I could do is just take a quick little look uh, and see here if we actually change some, like for example, uh, this random series <clears throat> as it comes through is being used for uh, nothing really in the outer loop, right? Um, so if we wanted to, we could just say that, you know, order entropy here is uh, the series that you're supposed to use. We won't use one here. Uh, and then instead of passing a pointer here, we'll just use the actual series directly. Uh, and restore that address of, right? That way it's using something local. It can see that it's never modified outside. Um, 
and uh, doesn't have to worry about, about accessing that uh, at a distance. Uh, and again, yeah, like I said, I'm not really sure why we got a slowdown from uh, inserting that call there. It does get called several times, I suppose. It could be actual real overhead, but I don't know. Uh, so again, that's a little bit better, uh, but still not, not perfect, right? Um, uh, and I'm not exactly sure uh, why we're sort of getting that uh, as an issue there. So that may imply that we need to keep it all in one place to weld it together properly. Um, I could try packing those things into a struct and accessing them that way uh, and see if that is actually an improvement. I'm just not sure. Again, it's hard to know specifically where we lost a little bit of speed there uh, with the call and to what extent that hurt us, right? Uh, so let me try packing, uh, and then from there, I guess we'll kind of figure out what happened. So here's the things that we provide, right? Um, and uh, here's the things that we need. Uh, so if we were to say that, well, cast sample arrays is just going to take this state uh, and everything that it does is going to be off of the state, uh, we could see to what extent that, uh, that helps us, right? Uh, so let's take a look here. I also don't know if I could just make this be um, grabbed directly. I'm just curious. What can I say? Let's get rid of that. I just want to see what the, I want to see where I can get the compiler in terms of just allowing us to have this be uh, sort of isolated off. And right now I'm just, I'm just seeing some slowdown there that I'm not sure why I'm seeing. So I'm just poking at it a little bit to see if I can figure out what it doesn't like. Um, and I may have to go look at the assembly again to figure out what's going on there. Uh, so if I just let it grab everything out like so, um, I'm gonna go ahead and accumulate these locally so that they don't actually have to access anything outside. And I'll only write them out here. Uh, I could even make that be an ad. So yeah, that looks roughly okay to me. Um, and so what I'll do now is I'll just say, all right, there's gonna be that cast state. 
I'm gonna go ahead and loft that up here. Oops. Into the H file. Like so. Uh, and then I'm gonna just fill it out. So when we go to render a tile, we're gonna have this cast state function. Uh, and all of the stuff that actually gets computed related to that, it's gonna go in there, right? Uh, and this, all I'm doing here is just moving that in to the state itself. Oops. I uh, and. All of that stuff is now ready to go, I think. That'll come out of here. That way we don't have to bother with this. And all we would really have to do here is clear final color. Start with nothing. Uh, and pull it out. Right? We could even make that a return value if we wanted to. Uh, not a member of cast states. So I see. But I would like it to be. Uh, and it looks like film width and height don't need to be a member of it either, but again, I think I would like them to be. So I'm gonna put them in there anyway. Oops. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, uh, so let's see where we're at here. Um, looks like we forgot to set the world pointer. And I think that's it. So yeah, again, just trying to figure out how to get the compiler to be okay with me pulling that code out and not taking too much of a speed hit for it. Um, I'm gonna go look at the assembly and see if we're doing anything particularly bad. Uh, we may be doing something particularly bad, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so there we go. Uh, whoa, although we've got some, that's interesting. That's really cool. You can see some of the tiles are kind of a little messed up there. Um, all right, uh, so let me just verify that we're setting everything here. I suspect we're probably not setting everything correctly, but uh, <laughs> that's really neat. Um, so, uh, yeah, now I got to go through and just make sure all this stuff is, is set up properly. Our, our final color, it looks like we don't actually have to clear final color. It looks like that gets written out properly. So that's actually not an issue there. Um, we were down to the correct speed, but it looks like we're doing things wrong. So that doesn't really count. Uh, so let's see what we actually messed up here. Um, it looks like these are our base parameters before we, uh, oops, calculate the state. So I wanna organize these a little bit here. Um, it looks like, do we ever use the world in here at all? No, we don't. Uh, so the other thing I'm gonna do here is just put that in here, like so, uh, and get it out of here. So you can see these are the things we actually are specifying here. 
Um, one past x max, that's really only used for the iteration, so that's not really used up here anyway. Um, so here we go. Let's take a look at all the things we need to compute here. Uh, so raise per pixel and max bounce count, um, those are both, you know, uh, specified exactly as they appear to be specified um, in the queue. So those are pretty trivial. Uh, and the world is the same. So those are just like straight pass through. Um, we then have, let's get rid of this for a second here. Uh, we then have the film X and film Y and the film width and film height. And those are actually, the film X and film Y are actually specified as you go through the loop. Uh, so I'm gonna kick them down to the very bottom here. Uh, and if we look at like half picks width, half picks, like that sort of stuff, uh, and the film width and height, that stuff is actually computed next, right? Um, I could actually move this stuff up as well, I suppose if I wanted to, we could do that, there we go. Um, put that back kind of where we had it. All right, uh, so if we take a look at this, we specify the camera position here, uh, the camera Z, uh, the camera X and the camera Y. Uh, we are specifying all of those and it looks like those are all correct. Uh, so that's good. Then we specify the width and the height. Those are specified here. Uh, and then we specify the, uh, the aspect ratio correction, uh, which seems all totally reasonable. Uh, we then specify the halves for the film. Uh, and we create the film center, like so. Um, and then we have the half picks width and height, oops, uh, that we're specifying here, which again is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we have the random series. So I think that's probably what we messed up. We forgot to set the random series. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Since that comes to, oops, since that comes directly out of the work order, again, I'm gonna kind of put it up here because that's sort of where that comes from. Uh, so it's just a little easier to follow. Uh, and we'll see if that helps us at all. All right, so that's pretty clean. That's relatively close to the time we had before. So I'm happy with that as a starting point. And now we've got a function called cast sample raise, which we can look at as something that will, um, that will do sort of all of the heavy lifting for us, right? This is where all of our time is spent. Pretty much this function is, uh, you know, the thing that we want to make as fast as possible. So if we want to start increasing the width of this, if we want to go ahead and up this to uh, computing four or eight rays at a time, then what we can sort of do is take a look at this rays per pixel value and say, um, well, what if we were to just, uh, you know, we, we could sort of do this one of two ways and don't, don't know exactly which way would be smarter off, off hand. So one way we can look at it is let's take the number of rays per pixel we're going to do, uh, and let's multiply that number of rays per pixel out uh, so that uh, we're casting, you know, uh, we're casting four or eight rays at once. Uh, and so the number of rays per pixel we cast will be, or the number of loops will be the rays per pixel divided by that width, four or eight, or 16 if you have AVX 512. Although I've heard AVX 512 is really dicey right now. Um, like apparently you don't really want to use AVX 512 yet. It's just not quite, the chips are not quite handling it like the i9s. That's what I've heard anyway. Just that's what I've heard. So yeah, we're talking about four or eight. So either we divide raise by raise per pixel by four or by eight and we go. That's one way to do it. That seems like the most straightforward way to do it. Might be the way we do it. The other way we could do it is cast sample rays actually takes uh, four film X's film Y's and actually does just the whole loop uh, as if you were doing four pixels at a time, right? So instead of looping 
over the uh, x's and y's as you know uh, as a individual pixel at a time we loop over four eight or 16 pixel blocks so a four by four block a two by two block that kind of thing um, or you know four by two in the case of eight something like that so basically coming up with some way of stacking that film x film y and what you can kind of see is that really this is the only thing that depends on that um so we could load in this film x and film film y could be wide and then we'd just run uh and I, again i don't really know which of those is best uh my gut instinct says, honestly, that we should just do it in pixel blocks. Uh, but that gut instinct could be very wrong. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I'm thinking maybe we just do that in pixel blocks. Uh, and I'm just trying to think of what the difference would be. So if we did it in pixel blocks, this whole loop, this is basically all exactly the same. Everything here is exactly as you see it, except it all gets eight wide. If we did it in rays per pixel instead, uh, then we have to do this eight times um, to sort of stack. We need to generate eight different bilaterals there and then add to a replicated X. So we do, you know, we do this eight wide like we normally would. This X gets replicated. Um, and then, we're, you know, we're off, uh, off and running. Um, and presumably everything else stays the same. I don't, yeah, I don't really think that there's anything left there to do. So I think everything else should be okay. So I don't know. Yeah, it's a hard call. It doesn't really make that much of a difference, I think, at the end of the day. Uh, so I suppose we can just keep it confined to this loop for now. Uh, so if we wanted to, uh, to start with that, what we need to do is take a look at all the, inst the instructions that we actually need to execute here uh, and try to get those things working in a way that's actually going to be wide, right? Uh, so what I want to do here is just start by transforming this to something that looks like it's going to be actually executing wide. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that there's something here called width uh, or lane width. And I'm going to say how many I want there to be. And so I'm going to start out with a lane width of four. Uh, and what that means is that the rays per pixel will be divided by that lane width. So I'm only going to, uh, I guess, uh, lane ray count or something like that uh, is going to be this rays per pixel divided by the lane width. So that's how many iterations of the loop we actually have to do because we're actually computing more rays than one every time through, right? Uh, and so this lane width here, uh, oops, sorry, lane ray count is uh, what we would loop over uh, and we would do, you know, each of these uh, only that only that many times. Now, if I were to run this, it would still run, and in theory, it should now run roughly four times faster because we simply aren't, you know, we're not actually doing the work that we said uh, that we were going to do, right? Uh, I will point out that I still think we have some weird artifacting going on there, uh, right? You can see some sort of weird tile boundary kinds of things happening there. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's an artifact of the random number generation. We'll have to take a look at it uh, a little bit later. But as you sort of drop that down to uh, a lesser number, right, you can see if the lane width is one, I don't think we see those artifacts. But if the lane width is four, so we're just doing, you know, 256 rays instead of 1024. 
Uh, you see it, and I don't know if that's because the contribution factors, like as you take more rays, you smooth over any errors in your, now you can still see them, right? You can definitely still see them there. And I don't think those are present previously, right? Uh, let me take a look. So here's our second day image. And yeah, you know, you know, you can't really see those, right? So my assumption again is just that that is something. So let me let me crank that. Let me uh, crank that lane. Count back to four there. Uh, and let's take a look. If we replace our XOR shift here. Uh, where we're doing our random unilateral. If I was to get rid of that again, so here's a C runtime library, Rand. Uh, I'm assuming that it's just uh, an artifact of the way that we're seeding the random number generator and the fact that our random number generator is not very random, like I said originally, uh, that causes that problem. But I just want to verify that. So you can see that, that we're seeing an artifact of that not really very random, random number uh, that's causing that. So I'm fine with that. Doesn't, I don't care about that at all right now. That's again, something that we need to do um, to take care of a little bit later on. So, but there you can actually see it. And this is exactly what I was talking about where your, your source of entropy matters, right? Uh, because if there's a bias to what it's producing, you will end up seeing that somewhere. Uh, but that's okay. Again, not really something that we care about. Uh, so really, so we'll take care of that a little bit later on. Uh, but for now, it's fine for our purposes because we're really just concerned about the uh, uh, the uh, part of the, the performance and the quality is something that will improve slowly over time. All right, so when we're doing our cast sample arrays here, uh, what we need to do is uh, we need to start figuring about how we're going to make this a little bit wider. And so if we take a look at what's going on here, some things like this, uh, a lot of these operations can just be done wide. A lot of them, like all of this stuff here, could just be done wide, right? So for example, if we introduced a type called the lane v3, for example, like this, uh, then a lot of these operations could simply be done as wide operations. Uh, and the same is true uh, really of, of most of these things uh, where we've got like, you know, uh, and that's actually a type that I use in, in the real world, hence it's built into the editor highlighting. Um, so if we were to go ahead and just start talking about a type that was itself actually wider, uh, a lot of this stuff we could actually just make be wide. And there really wouldn't be much else we'd have to do about it uh, as we go through these, uh, these sort of bounce computations. Most of this stuff, I think, uh, would actually just work. And so we'll have to see whether we can make that uh, happen. Now, when we do something like a bounce computation, uh, we have to be really careful about how we handle this uh, because we need to know whether or not uh, a lane is actually active or not, right? And there's this kind of uh, nasty uh, thing that has to happen here. Uh, so we're going to have to look at that as well. Uh, now, when we loop over things like the planes, that's all going to uh, work pretty much exactly as it should. Uh, but what we need to do is loft those plane values out into values that we can actually uh, operate on a little more cleanly. Uh, and for our purposes, what we could do, there's two ways we can approach this. Um, and uh, for the moment, we'll use the slower way, but we can try using a faster way in the future. 
Uh, right now, what we'll do is we'll use the slow way, which is that every time we iterate over the planes, we'll loft the values that are in the plane uh, out into actual replicated values that we'll test against. In the future, we could actually store uh, these probably a little bit differently and, and maybe test against them uh, in a little bit faster fashion, potentially. Uh, it might not really make a difference. That's why I don't want to do it at, at, at first, because it, we may find that there's really no benefit to be had uh, by fussing with it. But anyway, uh, so assuming that we were going to take uh, the plane end, for example, we'd have to put that out into a wider variable. Um, ray direction is already wide. Uh, this is a denominator, right? Uh, and then we get into sort of these if statements here, which are problematic for our purposes because uh, we need to compute when we do these ifs. Uh, we're going to end up computing something here that's actually could be different for every lane. Um, so what we need to do is we need to basically treat this more like a mask uh, where we're going to always be computing these values, but then we only actually use them sometimes, right? So what we want to do here is we want to turn uh, uh, this sort of stuff, for example, into something that's an actual mask. So we want, you know, maybe something like this, uh, which is like our, you know, our denom mask or something here. This, uh, these tests will produce a mask we can use where we will have ones in the places where it passed and zeros in the places where it failed for each lane, right? Uh, and then there's no, you know, there's no hierarchy to this, right? Because again, when you've got four things happening at once, some of them will be true and some of them may be false. So you have to execute all the code all the time. Um, you can put a test in so that if all of the things in the mask fail, right, then you don't have to do it. But for our purposes, there's so little code here. I don't know that a jump is really a good idea. Uh, so that's hard to say. Again, you have to test that figured out. Um, so the two things we're computing are the denominator here and the T. And again, this denominator is going to potentially be zero. We just have to allow divide by zero. And the mask will mask it out later. Uh, but basically, we have to make sure that the SIMD unit is in a place where it won't fault on divide by zero, which by default, I don't think it does. So I don't think there's anything in particular that we have to do there. Um, so we've got a denom mask and a T mask, right? You can see these two masks. Uh, what we need to do is we need to and these two masks together. Uh, and that gives us our final mask, right? So our hit mask is just going to be everywhere that the denominator mask and the T mask both passed, right? And where they both passed is a place where we actually have a T value um, that we want to record. And so the hit distance, hit mat index, uh, and next normal stuff, uh, all of that stuff will be uh, set conditionally. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to set these conditional, like a conditional e equals, basically, uh, where we say, okay, the hit mask is the thing um, where we basically say the hit distance um, is going to be set. If the hit mask is true, it will be set to T, right? Oops. Uh, and that plane, we need a couple other things here. So we've got the plane N, uh, but the plane D, right? So that's a lane F32. We've got the plane D here. Um, so that plane D has to come out as well. Like so. Um, and uh, all of these things. Uh, are going to get set in that fashion, right? So yeah, so you can see here exactly what we're doing. It's really straightforward. Uh, we just need uh, mail cost conditional assign. So basically, like a set this value equal to this value if the intermediating hit mask is set to one there or whatever, right? That's all I'm doing. Um, so then we would want to do the same thing with spheres, right? Uh, and in this case, the mat index, I guess, is also has to be. So we have a lane U32 here, which is the mat index, plane mat index. Uh, and that's plane.mat index. 
Uh, and that way we're not referencing anything. We, we loft these values out into four wide values or however wide we want, and then we do the operations we were going to do. Uh, so then we do our spheres, and we'd want to do the spheres the exact same way. So we'd have a lane v3, which is our sphere p. Uh, we would have our sphere radius. Um, and is there anything else? I don't know that there is. Let's find out a second here. I guess we got the mat index. Uh, so again, nothing particularly odd here. Uh, really nothing, nothing bizarre happening. Uh, all of these things will have to become lane related, uh, but now we've got the exact same uh, situation as we had before. Uh, where we've got some if statements here and we know that we can't really have if statements, right? Like if statements aren't going to fly, not unless there's a ton of code in them. If there's a ton of code in an if statement, uh, then we do want to keep the if, we still have to do all the code, but we want to have the if statement have a bailing condition, uh, which would basically be something that looks to see whether the, the masks that are computed are all zeros, and if so, it bails. I don't know that we've quite got enough code for that. We might. Um, I mean, there is a fair bit of code here. It could be uh, that we could save some time by branching around it. Same is true here, uh, but again, I don't really want to look at that just quite yet. Um, so here's our root mask, right? Um, this stuff all has to get uh, computed either way here. Um, this part, oops, is a little bizarre because this is essentially a thing that's just picking which of the hits to use. Um, so it's actually a dependent. Uh, so we've got a U lane 32 here, which is the, um, I guess the piss pick which hit we're doing. Uh, so we've got a pick mask there. Uh, and then we're doing a conditional assign of T on the pick mask like so, right? Uh, we've then got our hit mask. Oh, sorry, our T mask. And our hit mask is uh, whatever the root mask was anded with the T mask, just like before. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of conditional assignments. That's still a valid complaint. <laughs> So we're gonna leave it. All right. Uh, so, uh, what we have now done, like you can see here, is we've basically made these sort of nominally wide by making some types that would work if we defined them to be wide. We haven't defined those types yet, so this isn't going to compile at all. It's just going to be a bunch of errors. And then we've kind of sketched in what the actual operations are we need here. We need conditional assign. We need like, you know, inner product. We need uh, square root and so on. We need all of those things. We need normalizer zero and all that sort of stuff, right? Uh, so then we get to the part where we do our hit mats, mat index here. Uh, we kind of now have to deal with this other part where if we hit something versus if we didn't hit something, we have two different things to do. Uh, and that is the part that's actually a little bit uh, more complicated that we have to kind of work on, right? And so what we want to do here is say, all right, let's start uh, with, with a couple things that we need to put out at the head end. We have not done any Monte Carlo ter termination, by the way. Uh, so we need a lane u32 here uh, for our bounces computed, right? We need that. Uh, we need a lane u32 um, that's going to be our like active mask or our, our lane mask uh, and our lane increment. Uh, 
Uh, and what I want to do here is our lane increment is going to be one across the board, and our lane mask is going to be, you know, FF everywhere. So four copies where we've got the increment and the mask both in there, right? Uh, and zero for our bounce computed. Basically something that looks like this. Uh, and what I need to do now is every time through here where we're going to compute a bounce, uh, I want to take our bounces computed and I want to do an add on the bounces computed uh, uh, by the lane increment, right? And the reason I need to do it this way is because our bounces computed is now actually not just going to be the number, the width times the, the number times to the loop, right? Because we're going to go through the loop raised per pixel times divided by the lane width. But we, when before, so uh, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. So before, every time through the loop, we knew that we were only going through here uh, until we bounced enough. Because we would break out if we, if we hit the skylight and there was nowhere left to bounce, we would just break out of the loop, right? So we would naturally not count any additional bounces there um, because we wouldn't actually be executing this line of code. Here, we will keep going until all of the rays have not, can't bounce anymore, which means that some of the lanes will occasionally compute just sitting there doing computations that will just get thrown away because their ray already terminated somewhere with a bounce and there's nothing left to do with it yet. Now, in the future, we could get more sophisticated and try to do weird things like packing new bounce computations in there or whatever, right? But at the moment, we're trying to do just a dumb thing where we just are doing the same algorithm, just wider. And so in order to properly record the statistics here, what that means is that when we actually terminate a ray bounce chain down here, I'm going to have to actually zero out that lane in the incrementor so that we don't ever operate on that again on, for bounces computed. Right. Then at the end, when we need to do bounces computed, we need to just grab out the various parts of bounces computed um, and, uh, and sum them together. Right. Uh, so we basically want to do a horizontal add here on bounces computed to add all the lanes together. And that gives us how many bounces we actually did. How many we did per lane summed together is the total number of bounces. Right. Um, and we can do further work with that later on. Uh, okay, so then when we're in here with our hit mask index, I'm sorry, hit our hit math, hit mat index, uh, we get back to the same problem, which is that we want to do both of these paths for everybody. Uh, so what we want to do here, uh, sort of like with the conditional sign, uh, is we need to do these operations um, basically based uh, exactly on the thing that we were talking about uh, before, uh, where we, you know, um, where we do all of the stuff we're going to do for a bounce, but we only use it if that thing actually did properly hit something. And if it didn't properly hit something, then we just uh, ignore the calculations we did uh, and we do something else with it, right? Um, so what we need to do here is we need to uh, be a little bit more conscious of how we're tracking our materials. And there may be some things that we wanna do. It's hard to say whether this is correct or incorrect. I don't really know. Um, so it's worth taking a minute to talk about it. So what we see here is it's going to depend on how complicated our material is. But uh, what you can see is that we've got a bad downshift here. Um, we need to look up the materials for each of these things. Uh, and we've got like four or eight lanes worth where we would need to go look up off of that material index. Uh, and what you can kind of see here is that materials uh, as they currently stand are very simple. They've got uh, a scatter, an emission color, and a reference color. Uh, and we may really want to just, as we hit things, grab that information out and store it rather than looking it up after the fact. I don't really know. Um, so if we were just going to stick with something this simple, we would probably want to just do the conditional assign of these and track them as we go. However, the reason I'm not going to do that is because I'm going to assume that this is going to get more complicated later on. Uh, and that we're going to want to not copy it around every time we do a hit. That could still be wrong. I don't really know. 
Uh, but the point is we've now got a really nasty downshift here. Not something I really want to deal with, but what can you do? We don't really have a choice. Uh, so what we need to do here is we need to pull out the actual values of these materials and actually do uh, some kind of uh, processing that will, yeah, that will allow us to do as much wide work as we can uh, after loading some stuff. So let's start with the easy part first. Uh, these things here where we are doing these permutations, I think these actually will just work. Um, uh, I guess I need to just set this to lane here. Uh, anywhere we were doing a bilateral that needs to return a wide one, we, we need sort of a, a version that does lane-based stuff there. So these would both be lane. Um, and uh, most of the rest of this, right, I think just works. So all of this stuff here just works. And so the only thing we really have to do here, well, even ray direction, I think is probably fine. Um, yeah, I, I really don't think we need to do anything else. I think all of this is just fine as it is, right? Uh, so I think all of that stuff is fine. The only thing we need to do is, is here where we load the material out that just that stuff needs to get, uh, get sort of sliced, right? Uh, so yeah, this stuff is basically what we're talking about. So we have an emit color that we're going to have to do here, mat emit color. Uh, we've got a mat ref color. Uh, and we've got a mat scatter. Uh, and these are the parts uh, that we need to figure out how to load. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, for now, I want to get the rest of this stuff working. Uh, like I was saying before, uh, we now have to kind of figure out how we're going to make all of this stuff uh, work coherently. But as you can see, uh, we sort of have a couple different problems that we have to deal with here, right? Uh, so in one case here, we're doing a sample, had a mart attenuation, matte color thing, uh, sorry, matte emit color. Uh, we've got the same thing happening down here, right? Uh, from the matte emit color. Uh, so in either case, actually, if we look at what we were doing, in either case, we are doing this operation where the sample value does get incremented uh, by that matte emit color. So really that part stays the same, right? That part happens in either case with one sort of uh, important, uh, how should I say this? Uh, with one um, important caveat, and that's this break statement here. So every lane will get the its material color added to it unless this ray has already terminated, right? So we know that the mat emit color here, when it gets loaded out, uh, we know that that sort of has to properly get axed as it goes through, right? Um, so what I'm going to say, though, is just since we're doing a Hadamard product already, we know that if we set the emission color to zero on the mat emit color, uh, then we would be fine because it wouldn't do anything. Um, so like must return zero on mask, on, uh, on lane mask, right? Uh, so we need to zero out these on the, on that mask. Now, when we come through here, uh, the important part is our hit mat index. If our hit mat index was zero, we need to terminate that ray, but that's really easy for us to do in this case. Um, so we just need to do a not equal to zero. Uh, and if the thing was not equal to zero, then uh, it can proceed, otherwise it can't, right? Uh, so all we really need to do here is something that will extend that zero, um, you know, this sort of thing. So whatever our lane mask was, uh, right, and furthermore, our lane increment. In fact, you know what we could do? Yeah. So 
So here we'll just say, okay, the lane increment we don't have to store. You know, it's just one, but it gets masked by whatever the lane mask is, right? Uh, so here all we're doing is saying, hey, after we track that mid emission color here, we're then going to mask out anyone who didn't hit anything uh, is, is a dead ray lane now. That lane just stops getting computed entirely, right? Uh, then we just have, and that's the equivalent of our break statement, right? That's the break statement. It's saying, that's it. You know, we're not going to go any further in there. Uh, furthermore, here we can have this max bounce count. We can terminate this properly. We can say um, that at the end here, right? Uh, we know that you know if the lane mask, you know, if all zero, right? We could say if our lane mask falls out, so there's literally no more lanes at all, then stop, right? So only keep going while our lanes are, you know, um, you know. If we, we have something that we'll check, if these are all zeros, uh, then we don't want to, you know, we don't want to do it anyway, uh, anymore, right? Or uh, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll think about what this function has to be called. We probably don't want all zeros. We want to be able to only check like the high bit probably. It, 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 so what we probably want to do here is say if um, if high bit if all lane high if high bit of each lane is zero high bit of all lanes is zero something like that right so we can just say okay look if this lane mask we know there's all ones or all zeros in each slot. So look at the high bit of each or whatever, or, um, or whatever. Uh, but we don't even need that. It's just, we know that there's ones or zeros in each one. If, uh, something like that, I don't know. We'll just call it that. I don't know. I don't know what to call it, but point being, we know that we have a mask. We know that the mask will be ones or zeros entirely in each lane based on whether or not that lane is active. So we just need anything the processor can do. So if it was on ARM or SSE or whatever it was on, as long as there's something that can say, look to see whether there's any ones or any zeros in these slots, whichever kind of function you can support, we just need you to do that thing. And when it comes back, uh, we'll break if the mask is like therefore nominally zero. But we don't need you to look like, I, I just trying to figure out what the name would be for saying, we don't need you to look at each bit because we're, we're promising you that all the bits in each lane will be the same value. They'll all be ones or they'll all be zeros. So you don't have to check them all, right? Um, that's all I was trying to get across with the name and it was a little bit, a little bit difficult. Okay, um, so that's what we're doing there. And now we've got our situation where we sort of have what we want uh, sketched out here. Uh, it's the load that's a little bit a little bit tricky, but let me finish the rest of this. So after we update our lane, uh, then we go through and we just uh, say here that we need to clamp this this stuff. So we do an inner product, um, and uh, we want to do a clamp here. Like uh, this this I can rephrase uh, as uh, I want to take the maximum value. Uh, whichever one is higher, right? I either want to take, uh, I either want to take the inner product or I want to take zero, right? Whichever one's higher. Uh, we're going to produce the uh, new attenuation value by multiplying these two together, and that's all fine. We're going to update the ray origin this way. Um, we are going to then do the permutations this way, and uh, that's about it right? Um, and off we go. Uh, so each one of these, like I said, is, is kind of calculating uh, a sample value. So at the end here, we're going to end up with the final color uh, that we need to actually output. Uh, that's getting summed. And you can see that now this is sort of wide. Uh, this contrib time sample is now not really an accurate uh, um, uh, value yet because we now have four color values that are sort of stacked, right? 
uh, horizontally. Uh, so we then need to do a V3, uh, we, we need to do a horizontal add on this as well, uh, where we sort of add together um, those four different V3s that we've, that we, or however many there are, smush them together into an actual final color uh, that we can then return, right? Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is actually a mistake in that case, uh, because since we're summing everything together still and the horizontal add, we do need that four still in there. So this contrib value actually is still raised per pixel. I think it doesn't change, right? I think that's all the same. Uh, now that contrib value, when we do the multiplication down here, that sample and final color, all of that stuff is actually uh, lane V3s. Um, so that uh, I think all of that actually, yeah, actually needs to be contrib and sample. All of that stuff uh, needs to be lane V3s. So these are really um, still lane V3s. Uh, and bounce com bounce is computed here. Uh, I think actually comes out here, right? Um, so bounce is computed again. That's getting added to uh, every time uh, through the loop like this uh, So I think all of that is pretty much right uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, All right So looking at how these are happening here where we've got camera X and all that stuff. So all of these now also want to be lane based, right? Uh, and they're just lane based constants. And what we need to do here uh, is just assume that they're just going to be replicated, right? There's no, these values can all be just replicated out. So these will just replicate them into laned values, right? So I think now we have effectively have everything we need um, sort of sketched out with how this would be SIMDized, right? Um, and so what I want to do now is I want to just do a quick sketch of making this work one wide. So we did all this work, right? But I could just make the lane width be one and define all of these functions to stub out to their actual versions that we already wrote and it should still work. And that way we can debug the like masking and all that stuff without actually having to use any SIMD instructions and without worrying about any of that, right? Uh, so if I look in Handmade Ray, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, open a thing called ray lane, uh, an h file that's just going to define all of this stuff. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, well, you know, an f32 is just a is just a um, a lane f32 and a lane u32 and a lane v3. They're all just what they are uh, already, right? I, there, there's nothing special about them at all. They're all exactly what you think they are, right? Um, and uh, then I'm gonna go ahead and include that in here. Uh, so in addition to ray math, we're gonna include ray lane.h um, and off we go. Uh, and so then we only have just a few errors left to go, uh, like bilateral lane, right? Um, and uh, that's something I'll put in here. So this is gonna return uh, a lane F32. And all that is, is like so. Uh, then we've got this conditional assign. <clears throat> I'm gonna put that in here. Uh, and the conditional assign <clears throat> Uh, this just takes, you know, the various different types that we've said here. We've got, you know, uh, a mask, a dest, <clears throat> a 
and a source. Uh, and all we're going to do here is say that dest equals, you know, uh, <clears throat> if the mask is one, we want the source to be assigned. So we want to do an and with the source, right? That will tell us which of the source things to come in. Then we want to take the opposite of the mask. Whatever the mask was, we want to flip it so that we, now we have ones in the places where the mask was not set. Uh, and that's what would tell us which part of the desk to keep. And then we or those two together, right? So we're just doing a thing where we basically, we take the mask and we use the positive version of the mask to pick out the source, the negative version of the mask to pick out the desk, and that is what updates our desk, right? Uh, so that's good. Um, what is the problem? Address is illegal, write operand, write operand? Oh, oh, here we go, there we go. I'm like, what, what was the problem there? Um, I don't see what the problem is. Oh, I do see what the problem is. Okay, so this is just the artifact of C. For some reason, C doesn't let you mask floating point values. I don't know why. Um, so I have to cast this to a U32 first, right? It's just annoying. Um, so these are floating point values and I have to cast them, right? Uh, conversion from lane 32 to lane F32. Yeah, so this will produce an entirely uh, It's gonna do it entirely in U32s because the only things that allow masking and oaring together. Uh, but we know that this is actually an F32, right? Anyway, uh, so once we have that, we know we can do the one for U32. The one for U32 is even easier. In fact, we could now just call the U32 one to do the F32 one, right? Um, so, you know, I'll leave it like this for now, but we could just call we, we could just call the U32 one to do the F32 one instead, right? Uh, so in this case, now we don't need the casting because it's actually just the way we want it. Um, and so we can just do this directly now because we don't have to do the reinterpreting all the time. There we go. Uh, right. Uh, so again, yeah, if we want to do it this way, we could do, uh, in fact, let me, let me just do it, right? Uh, so what we could do is say, well, pretend this is a U32, you know, pretend this is a U32. Right. Do the operation uh, and then assign desk to it. Or assign it to desk, I should say. Right. So now we have like an F32 version and a... a um, And a U32 version uh, to avoid a conditional assign. Oh, you know what? We don't even have to do it that way. Never mind, because this does the assign directly. So there we go. Uh, and then finally, we just need the one that works on uh, V3s. And that one is pretty easy to do because this one will just call three times. Uh, oops. The conditional assign on each of the members, right? So this will be like dest x mask source x right this just this just replicates the function across the various values right um uh and this looks like a what is hit distance here hit distance Distance is a lane F32. And T is an F32. Hit mask is a U32. What's the problem? None of the others could convert the types. Ah, because these need to be addresses. It's fine. Uh, this is our load that we haven't finished yet. Here's our max. Uh, so our max value, again, this is a kind of a special version we've got to do here. That's okay. 
Uh, so here's our max, that's going to take an A and a B, and it's going to return uh, whichever one is higher, right? Uh, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, if A is higher than B, then return A, otherwise return B. Oops. Right, that will return the maximum value in either case. Uh, and then we've just got our last sort of two here. Uh, we've got an internal uh, bool, which is mask is zeroed. That's going to take one of our lane masks. And we've also got the horizontal add. That's going to return an F32. If you got a lane F32, Uh, and it's going to return a V3 if you got a lane V3. So basically, whichever one you were trying to horizontal add, it will horizontal add it. Obviously, this one can be written in terms of the other one. Um, so the result in this case can just be horizontal adds on the components, right? Uh, so we don't really need to write this one. We only really need to write this one. In this case, because we are talking about the scalar version, Horizontal add actually doesn't do anything. There are no lanes to add together, uh, so the result is just whatever the result, is, whatever you passed in. Right? Mast is zeroed, same thing. Uh, we don't really have to check multiple masks because we've only got one, so the result is just if the lane mask is not equal to zero, or I should say is equal to zero. Right? Uh, and that's about it. Now, if we take a look at what else we've got here, uh, conversion from lane 32 to lane F32. Uh, so we need a, a U32 version there, I guess. Uh, maybe we don't actually have uh, any of these other than used in the V3 one, but that's no big deal. Uh, so here's the U32 version. <clears throat> uh, and here's the horizontal add. Now, we do have one slight problem here, which is that I we wouldn't be tracking a full 64 bit. So if we turned out we multiplied, too, we did too many of these bounces, uh, we could wrap. Uh, and so I don't know exactly how we want to prevent that. Um, we won't be having that problem if we keep the tile sizes small enough, but you know, uh, I should probably put it to do in because it's uh, a little bit dicey, right? Um, and uh, so in here where we do bounces computed, I should probably put it to do. Um, so the last thing we need to do is have some way of loading these things up here. Uh, you know, hit mat index again. Um, this, because of the way we're doing it, uh, we can just make this whole thing a to do here. And uh, and end. Uh, uh, because since we happen to know that all of these uh, our scalar at the moment, this can just be cheesed uh, by loading out just one. But we're gonna have to load out lane width of those uh, eventually. Uh, sphere mat index looks like it wasn't loaded. Uh, this needs to be a dot here. There we go. Uh, all right, and so now we've got some debugging to do, uh, and that's probably what I'll finish the stream with is just, uh, I'll probably turn off the automatic raycast part of this here, um, and we'll go debug anything that we messed up. Um, you can see not a particularly uh, great result there. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we definitely have a couple bugs in it. Um, but uh, again, all we have to do is just debug these, and then we're in position to actually, next time we do Handmade Ray, um, we're in position to kind of, you know, move to a SIMDized version fairly cleanly that won't be too bad, right? Okay, uh, so the first thing I wanna do is in build.bat, I don't really wanna be running this anymore. I don't want um, to, uh, to actually, uh, I don't wanna actually run the Raycaster. I just wanna compile uh, because I wanna run in, it in the debugger. Uh, and so all I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna step through here and see roughly what's going on. Uh, in the parts that I think might be somewhat suspicious, right? 
Um, so I'm just gonna first take a look at like what's happening like with off X and off Y. And, oh, whoops, uh, let me also in our build.bat, let me uh, go ahead and change this to be uh, unoptimized so that it's easier for us to inspect the values in the debugger and see what's going on. Uh, so let's take a look at what these are. Uh, oh, and one other thing I also like to do is turn off threading. Um, so somewhere in here we get a core count. Here we go. Uh, and so now we won't have multiple threads kind of racing through here, making it annoying. Uh, so here's our offset X and our offset Y. Uh, just gonna look and see. Yeah, that looks pretty reasonable. Uh, one thing I will say is this is, we got some errors in here, you know, when we actually go to tighten this stuff up. This, this is not the center of a pixel, it's the corner of a pixel. So this should really be a random unilateral, I think. Uh, I think that's just wrong. In fact, let me just change that while we're at it. Uh, right, I mean, unless I'm wrong about that, uh, film X, film Y are the very corner. So you're only going in. So you really don't want it to be half pix W, you want it to be just pix W and H. Uh, we could set it to the center, uh, would be the other option. Um, I mean, I could just do this instead, I suppose. Right? Uh, where we would just step into the middle and then that way it is random bilateral. Maybe I'll do it that way. I mean, why not? Um, not a lot of reason not to, I suppose. Uh, oops. H. So just notice that as a stepping through, might as well fix it while I'm there. Uh, so now our offsets are properly, I think, uh, properly set. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why we didn't notice that. Looks like our state value is zero. That also seems wrong. Why is our state value zero? We do initialize these somewhere, right? I mean, here's where we initialize these. We put it into order entropy. Uh, when we come through here uh, and we do render tile, uh, we assign state series to order entropy. So I'm really not sure why that's zero and I would like to know. So I'm gonna step back out here cause I'm again, just a little bit weirded out by that. Um, so here's our random series and there's nothing in the state value. Uh, if we take a look at the work order itself, the entropy value is also zero. Uh, so I'm just curious to know, uh, oh, you know why? Because we don't have any offset here. Uh, the other thing we kind of need to do and I should I should probably just do it now as well. Um, I should probably make sure that this entropy value gets updated uh, per the state. Uh, like I think we kind of want to do this. So that we, um, so that we, as we step through the pixels, we're using different random rays. Because the way we had it before, we wouldn't update it. So every pixel would use the same random series, which doesn't seem like a good idea, right? Um, all right. That looks more correct to me. There's our film P. Uh, setting up the origin and the direction here for this uh, ray. Um,
all that stuff seems right. Setting up the sample, setting up the attenuation value, setting up the lane mask. Uh, then we come through the bounces, um, starting up our hit distance, hit mask, all that stuff gets cleared. Our lane increment is one, our lane mask uh, is still on. So we're gonna do bounces computed, should, should ink up one. Uh, we go through our planes, we get out the planes, we do our uh, masks, right? Uh, and I guess one problem, you know what? There's our problem right there. Um, when we do these comparisons, uh, one of the problems we're gonna run into here is that they need to be set to all ones or all zeros, and at the moment they aren't, right? Uh, and so that conditional assign is gonna break. So that's the first thing, you know, uh, I'm thinking SIMD terms, uh, and we didn't really replicate what's gonna happen in SIMD correctly. Uh, so what we actually want to do there when we do conditional assign, I suppose, uh, is instead of masking, we need to do it as an actual test uh, because that mask is not going to be right. Now, the way I could do that is do uh, mask equals mask, right? Uh, so if there's anything set in the mask, it will become all Fs. Otherwise, it's going to become zero, right? Uh, let me try that. Uh, now when we go into the conditional assign, right, the mask will be set to all Fs, uh, and then we'll do a mask of the source, or with a mask of the inverse of the dest there, right? Uh, and then we should be set to one or the other, so the dest should now be equal to the source, for example, in this case, which it is. Um, and so that's a little bit better off. Uh, all right, uh, let me go ahead and let that run. Um, let me see, I don't know, I want a picture of where we're at bug-wise. Um, uh, and this is gonna be a lot slower because we've introduced a bunch of complexity that didn't need to be there, right? Um, for the scalar version in order to go wide. And so, you know, this is, this is gonna be a slower version um, than our previous version for Scalar, for sure, right? Uh, and you can kind of see it creeping up there. Uh, so let's just take a look at what we ended up with there. Um, so it's not that far off anymore, right? We're, we're a little bit closer. Uh, we're obviously doing a little bit of our summation wrong, but at least we've got our first emission tracking properly there. Uh, so we don't have a completely wrong image now. We just are not summing quite properly. So much closer. Okay. Uh, so let's see if we can finish the mat index stuff and just end up with something that's, that's roughly correct. I'm also gonna try to reduce the ray count, um, the rays per pixel there. Uh, so I'm just gonna say like, hey, 16 rays per pixel, right? Real, real tiny number of rays. Uh, so that we can just really quickly run it um, and get our output image, right? All right, so now while we're trying to fix that, I'm gonna go back to the build.bat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make it so that we can still get our output back. So here we go. Uh, and now what I want to do is say, all right, uh, I want to go see, also, uh, we're not running parallel either. So that's the other thing that slows us down. We're, we're eight times slower just from that as well. Uh, and I can, I suppose I can put that back in now too. 
All right, so now what I want to see is uh, what am I messing up in terms of that summation? So our final color, you know, when we hit an emitter, we're doing the right thing, but we're not, we're not bouncing right. So once we do a bounce, we've got an issue, right? And we don't know exactly what that issue is. Uh, let's double check that mask is zeroed is not doing something weird uh, as well. So mask is zeroed. Uh, if the lane mask equals zero, then it is zeroed. So we should break, uh, that seems reasonable. Uh, lane mask equals lane mask and hit mat index uh, equals zero. Uh, that should in theory work okay. Cause again, it's just using the low bit. Uh, so I think everything should be fine there. Uh, but we could double check that. Uh, let's take a look at anything else that's weird here. We have our, our hit mat index. Uh, we're looking up these. Um, yeah, I may want to step through in debug mode one more time and take a look at what's going on in here. Just see if there's anything else suspicious. We're lurping the random bounce. And the sample is always accumulated with whatever the mat emit color is. The attenuation value is built up over time properly. So that looks about right to me. And the sample value at the end, contrib time sample, uh, all of that looks about right. So I am going to do one more step uh, through here in debug mode. So I take it back, take everything back that I said. Uh, and just make sure that this works okay. Again, with only 16 rays per pixel, it should be a lot faster, hopefully. So no big issue there. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and you can see the problem that we're having here is our bounces aren't working properly. So whatever emitter it, it hits, uh, it works. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's only if it hit an emitter right off the bat. So let's take a look at what the first hit happens to be here. Uh, the hit material index is one. That means that this uh, one should keep going. Uh, the attenuation value properly did attenuate based on the matte reflection color and the cosine there. Uh, and our, our lane mask, well, there you go. Our lane mask is wrong. Uh, and I'm not sure why. So let's just double check that. It might be a bit thing again, like I was saying. Uh, let's see what the lane mask actually is equal. It's FFF. That's, that's fine. Uh, so when we come down here, the hit material index is one. Uh, the lane mask, so when I do this and, uh, I'm getting, ah, that's supposed to be not equal to zero. That's our problem right there. So do you see that? We've got the lane mask, uh, and this is an and equals really, right? We wanna produce the mask from this. If it equals zero, we're supposed to terminate. So we wanna not, we want, the ones that don't terminate. So we want not equal to zero is what we're trying to actually produce here, right? Uh, so that's just updating the lane mask incorrectly is the only problem that we're getting there. All right, Let's see what kind of image we get here. Uh, so that is looking correct to me again, uh, for the most part. Uh, let's go ahead and change this back up to our optimized version, which will now unfortunately be a lot slower than it was. Um, where's our rays for pixel, 1024, right? Uh, and I think that's it for today. Uh, cause I think now we're back to operating properly, uh, with basically SIMD style code. And so the only thing that we have to do is, uh, next session, there we go. Um, the only thing that we have to do is next session, turn this into actually executing SIMD, uh, and go from there. Right. Uh, now, as you can see here, we're at 21 milliseconds of bounce now uh, instead of 09. And that's because, again, we introduced a lot of inefficiency here uh, because we are preparing to do it wide and we're not actually using any of those nice wide instructions. 
Uh, and so a lot of things that just didn't need to happen anymore, you know, are, are still happening. Um, let me double check. So we seem to be darker as well. So it looks like maybe we've got a summation error in there. Um, so we might not quite be uh, done debugging yet. And so let's take a look at what's going on with that. Uh, so if we take a look at this contribution here, um, ah, that's our problem. Uh, so the lane width has to be actually set properly. So I'm gonna go into Ray Lane here and I'm gonna find this. Uh, so lane width four is what we had before, but we don't, we're not actually doing that. So the lane width is one in our current uh, implementation. And so now I was wondering why it was, yeah, uh, um, it, was, it was getting an unfair speed advantage there. Um, because it was terminating pretty fast and like it seemed like it was running about as fast as the old one was but it clearly showed it was twice as slow per bounce so i'm like what's going on it's like okay that the reason is because we actually didn't run as many rays through it so hey yeah it was slower per bounce but it was not running as many bounces right um so there's that uh so anyway uh, so I think we're good now, probably. Uh, and again, we just have to take a look. So there we go. And you can see that the image is basically uh, indistinguishable. Um, now, I believe probably from the other uh, ones in that directory. Let's find out. Can I flip between them? Yeah. So you can see those are pretty much indistinguishable. So those are our three. Um, they're indistinguishable. The only real difference is we fixed the pixel center. So this one has a correct test bitmap has a correct pixel center and the other one doesn't. Um, but I think we're good now. Uh, and all we really have to do now is finish our optimization there to see uh, how good we did. Now, I probably should have saved one using the correct RAND and for, uh, where you know we could actually benchmark against that. Um, but that's really all we uh, saved, unfortunately. So if we want to in, hand, in lane now as well, uh, what I can do here is say if lane width equals one, believe I can do that, right? Um, in theory, if you run this right, uh, then we can, you know, have lane width equals one be a case here. Uh, and then what we can do is say, all right, let's put in some other ones here. So there's, uh, you know, if lane width equals four, uh, then we'll have the code uh, for that, right? Uh, Uh, and if we want it to be super saucy up here, we can also put in um, a version of it that is eight wide, for example. So what we would need to do if we want to increase, oh, and also if we do laden width equals eight, it should say, hey, laden width must be set to something. Um, uh, and so now we're just supporting one or four. And if we were to look at sort of, if I was to sort of sketch out what this would look like, uh, then what we're gonna do here is say, well, we've got different looking things, right? Um, so if we were actually going to do a lane width equals four, then we have to actually make these things work. So for example, lane F32, uh, we're gonna have to actually pound include. Uh, I don't know what the right intrinsic thing is anymore. Uh, let's see what we did on Handmade Hero. Um, it's just always this you know, ridiculous nonsense. Uh, oops. Maybe some platform. Uh, yeah, so we probably need to do something here like this, uh, depending on which one we're on. We're gonna need to have this sort of stuff. Uh, at the moment, I'll do
one of those. Uh, so we'll define compiler MSVC, so we'll get that uh, intrinsic in there. Uh, and then we can actually use the MM uh, versions here, so uh, like that. Uh, so I think it's M128. Again, I never use these. I always define my own because these things are nuts. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, M underscore underscore M128. Uh, so anyway, uh, we would have to define <clears throat> uh, values for each of these. Uh, these are integers. These are not. Uh, the lane v3s are just going to have uh, one of these each for the x, the y, and the z, like so. Uh, and then each of these functions has to actually be implemented for it and a whole lot more. The reason I'm not going to finish this stuff right now is specifically because even though we can do these, uh, you'll note that a whole bunch of other things uh, are not actually set properly. Um, so for example, uh, you can see here we've got a bunch of stuff where, oh, and, and I suppose these should also be moved up in here. I might go ahead and move these into the math. So here's the Ray math stuff, uh, right? I might go ahead and, and move these into there, like so. Uh, and then random bilateral lane, I think I might move into Ray lane because it's going to be dependent. So the scalar version is here uh, and the non-scalar version would be in here, right? Uh, and so the way that would work again is, you know, we'd need to create uh, some kind of a, right, this sort of thing uh, where we do a, you know, uh, and then set uh, EPI 32 kind of a thing. And, you know, this, this kind of nonsense here where we'd take, uh, for these values, we'd, we'd run the thing four different times and put them in here. Now, eventually what we'd want to do is actually just keep the state wider. Um, yeah, actually, you know what? That's, that's gonna be the smarter thing to do. So really what we want is all of this stuff has to kind of be in here probably, right? Um, and I guess what we could do is make the series itself, that value could be dependent on the lane. And that might just work for all I know, I'm just trying to think now, it might be that we can just make this all work in terms of lanes. Let's, let's, try, let's try that. Let's try that. Let's just see, I'm just curious, because that might just work, right? I'm not sure if it would or if it wouldn't, but it might. Um, so let's see, I, I take back what I said before and I put one of these in here and I just say that this stuff um, looks like this. Uh, and so all of this stuff works on uh, lane F32s. Uh, effectively, this would go away. So you just have random bilateral like so, and it produces just a lane's worth of them. And so then the only weird part here is this has to get converted up. Uh, so what we would do here is we'd say, um, you know, this this is re returning a lane u32. Uh, and so we'd want to do something where we would say, uh, you know, uh, lane f32 from u32. Uh, so we'd have some way of doing that cast and, you know, normally it would just be something that looks like this. Uh, but it would actually be a real SIMD thing, uh, in the future, right? Uh, so I'm going to set the lane width back down to one. I'm going to go into ray.h and I'm going to take uh, this random series bit here and I'm going to just extend it out to that. Then I'm going to look at anywhere that we used to call this and I'm going to take it so that instead of saying random bilateral lane, um, I'm just going to make it so that it's always calling random bilateral instead. 
Uh, and then I'm going to compile and see if it works. Uh, it looks like it does. Um, so yeah, so that way what we could do there is make that way our random number generator will also work lane wide because if you take a look at what's actually going on in it, nothing that it does is actually not um, supported in SIMD, so we should just be able to use SIMD on it, uh, right? Um, so so that's fine, uh, right? All of this stuff uh, is stuff that we could probably do in SIMD just fine because there should be an XOR in there and there should be a shift by a intrinsic value in there. And so those are things that we can just do and uh, we shouldn't have to worry too much about it. Uh, now, if I zoom in here, one of the weird things about this is I don't see the block pattern anymore. I, so I think the fact that uh, that block pattern actually wasn't a problem with the random number generator, it was just because I wasn't rolling the entropy foot forward per pixel uh, and had like zeros in there and stuff. So, so actually we're fine. XR shift's totally fine. That's good too. We don't really need to do anything fancier than that. Uh, all right. Um, so that's it for today. I think I'm going to wrap it up. Maybe tomorrow we'll do the actual implementation just to not leave it hanging. Uh, and so that we can specify lane widths uh, that are greater than four. Um, so we'll just say like, you know, Uh, and again, this right here, uh, we, you know, we can just sort of um, also say that, you know, maybe we'll do this one too, you know? Uh, and uh, that would just be that, and then I don't even know if this is supported yet, exactly how, uh, yeah, it, it'll, it'll be supported. Uh, but uh, I don't know exactly uh, which of these things you have to include these days, but uh, this would just be if we were to use uh, the wider equivalence of these, uh, then we could go ahead and use eight white SIMD as well. So I'm just gonna check to see, um, yeah. Uh, so as far as I know, if we want to, we can just use M256s as well. Uh, and that way we can have an eight wide, a four wide, and a one wide path, and we can just compile it however way uh, we want. Uh, and there you go. So I think that's really all we'll have to do, and we'll implement those probably tomorrow. Let me go ahead to a brief Q&A here, uh, just in case anyone has any questions about what we did there. Um, Uh, and again, what you can sort of see, uh, what I did was just a really basic um, sort of prep where I said, all right, I'm going to put this code into a state where it still runs scalar, but it runs scalar in such a way that it can be made wide trivially. Uh, and then that way I can debug it uh, but before it actually runs wide, where things could get uh, more difficult. Right. How would one implement something like a bloom effect in a ray tracer? Um, so uh, it depends exactly what you mean by bloom. Uh, but let me go ahead and uh, and sort of assume I know what you mean by Bloom. Uh, so I don't know if we, we don't have an image processing program installed here, do we? Uh, we, could, we could install GIMP here uh, and, and I could maybe take a look at, at uh, producing something, but I'll just, uh, I'll just see if I can, uh, I don't want to be in Bing. Wait, how come we're not, how do we get, end up in this browser? If this is Cortana, I, ugh. All right, whatever. Anyway. Uh, 
so what I wanted here was halation. Um, and what I want to talk about here is where that, I think the bloom you're talking about, I'm not sure which bloom you're actually talking about because um, there's a lot of different way, places that bloom can come from. Uh, but halation is actually the thing that you're probably uh, talking about. And I don't know whether there's some anime thing called halation, which apparently could, could be get. Could I get the actual thing instead of the anime, please? There, is, that, is that too much to ask? Um, uh, so anyway, uh, there's a couple different places that the bloom you're talking about could come from. And I don't know which one you're talking about. So the answer changes depends on which one you want. But generally speaking, um, there are two places where light uh, that, that can cause light to bloom. So the first thing that could cause light to bloom, uh, and the one that I assume you're talking about, is called film halation. And what that is, is that's when light, fo you know, photons entering the lens of the camera, um, they end up hitting uh, the film, bouncing through the film substrate and hitting a part of the film outside of where the film was. And the reason that this happens is because if you have a lot of light hitting an area, uh, not all of it will be absorbed by the film elements if there's so much photons going through. Uh, some of them can scatter out to neighboring parts of the image. Uh, and furthermore, inside the lens assembly, light can if there's a lot of light coming in to a particular place relative to everything else, it can bounce around elements inside the, the hood or inside the lens assembly and hit places it's not supposed to hit. So that's one kind of halation. And that's the kind of halation that you see maybe up in here where there's just a little bit of blur out. Now there's bigger blurs like, like in here, for example, right? Where it's really bloomy. Uh, and that is gonna be a combination of the film halation itself. Here's a good example. There you go, right? Um, this is the first kind where it's just the film itself is, is blooming because it's hitting neighboring parts of the film. Uh, but there's another kind, which is that basically light can scatter in the atmosphere when there's a lot of light coming in. If there's any participating media, it can be scattered there. Uh, and that's more a principle of like fog, mist, atmospheric particles that are scattering the light before it ever reaches the lens of the camera. Both of these things you could simulate in a ray tracer uh, to varying degrees, and it depends on how you want to do them, right? But both of them are simulatable because you can just do exactly these phenomenon. You don't even have to hack, that, hack them if you're willing to just do them directly. Uh, you can actually simulate the potential for something to bounce around inside the lens, lens assembly. You can simulate the effect of something bouncing in the film substrate layer. And you can even simulate participating medium uh, by storing those volumes and introducing random ray permutation inside the volume. So all three of them are things you could simulate. Uh, they're all fairly advanced, right? That's when you're starting to get into like a pretty physical um, light simulator. You can also, of course, cheese this. Uh, you can do this. Uh, the, a ray tracer can do the same tricks that a non that a uh, rasterizer can do. So if you don't really care about accurate simulation and you're just looking to get that effect for cheap, you can just use a post processing filter. That's what games do, um, and all they do is they take the final rendered image and they threshold it to see uh, if stuff is very bright. They just blur it out into the neighboring pixels. And there's not much more to it than that, right? Uh, so you can also use the cheese way. And for an effect like this, the cheese way may be fine because there's not a lot of really important stuff that happens in halation that you want to capture. Um, if you're trying to do participating media, that's a harder thing. That is less easy to cheese, period. It's less easy to cheese in a ray tracer and in a rasterizer. A ray tracer has a bit of an advantage in terms of reproducing it accurately because it can just actually do random ray permutation and yeah, it costs a lot to do that, though, but once you're doing it, uh, you're fine. And so I guess what I would say is that's uh, kind of a six of one half dozen of the other sort of situation uh, there. Uh, anyway, uh, let me take a quick look before I end here, by the way, I, I wanted to uh, see if we should 
do a capture here. Um, so we're actually a little bit faster, even even though we were much faster and we slowed ourselves down a little bit. Um, so I am going to go ahead and do uh, a, a ray cast here for posterity while we're waiting. Uh, wait, first day image, second day image? But haven't we done three separate days? Shouldn't this be second day image, third day image? Uh, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, it's the 18th, regardless. This is the fourth day, right? Am I missing something? What's going on here? Handmade Hero 0, Handmade, handmade Ray 1. Oh, there's no O2. We said it wrong. We said it wrong. Oop. <laughs> oh well. Uh, let's do it that way. And I'll uh, fix those in a second. My bad, sorry, sorry everyone. Uh, just a uh, slight uh, error there. Just uh, we'll rename those. No one will be any the wiser. Anyway, uh, so that's what Bloom is. Hopefully that helps. Is the halt in two, three sequence a good way to generate sample positions? I've heard about some people using it. It is a low discrepancy series. Um, yeah, so I am not really an expert on sampling patterns. Blue noise and blue noise based sampling patterns tend to be the correct ways to generate sample positions in terms of what is most pleasing to your eye at the end. The Halton series does sort of try to approximate a blue noise pattern, but it's not as good as blue noise. I don't know. You'd have to ask a more ray tracing sort of person if it's good enough, right? Um, and also depending, you know, the, the use scenario may determine what is good enough and what is not good enough, right? Um, let me just take a quick look here. I want to see what these two things say. Are these similar? I just want to see if they're similar or numbers. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Okay. Um, so I'm going to change the way these are written here. So this is going to be day zero. It's going to be day one. And then this will be day zero two. All right, so we've got three images here um, uh, that are all about the same. And I think by the time we finish tomorrow, and that will be four days of handmade ray, uh, we will have it quite zippy, uh, which is nice. And then really, uh, we could do a bounding volume hierarchy and try to push the sphere count up really high, or we could go down the accurate light range of things. And uh, so, yeah, we'll see. All right. When you learn this way, uh, oh, sorry. When you learn this way of doing SIMD, I remember in Handmade Hero when we had optimized the render, we use MM28 every way. Um, so you can do them either way and uh, so it depends on to the, 
it's not really a learn this way or not learn this way. Uh, it's just a choice about which one you want to do. We did both in Handmade Hero, actually. If you remember uh, in Handmade Hero, um, uh, we've got this one, right? Uh, and this is all using the exact same technique that I just did, uh, where you sort of have a type. Um, and that type is a four wide thing, right? Uh, but the reason you'd use one or the other is if you've already got a function that you know exactly how it works, like we did in Handmade Hero where we had a render and we're like, this is exactly what it needs to do. Then I usually just hand code it with MMs. The reason is because the compiler sometimes does stupid stuff with overloaded operators. Um, if I have a function that we're going to evolve over time, then I use the overloaded operator method. And uh, the reason that I do it that way is because I don't want to lock it down to a bunch of MM operations until I actually know exactly what those operations are, because otherwise I'm just wasting my time. What is your take on anti-aliasing methods? I'm currently looking for one for my game. I see the witness has multi-sample anti-sample anti anti-aliasing anti option only. No FXAA or TXAA. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on it, honestly. Uh, I just don't have a lot of experience with those methods. Are there any machines with hardware random number generators that just puts random values into a register with one instruction? Uh, yeah, x64 actually has one, uh, and we may very well use it for the initial seed. Um, as far as I know, there are no really fast ones, though. Let's see. Let me see. Uh, RD Rand clock cycles. Uh, Yeah, so uh, 463 clock cycles down to 117 clock cycles. So uh, Ryzen 1200 clock cycles or 2500 clock cycles. So you can see that they're slow, right? So I wouldn't necessarily call this on anything that you like. I, I wouldn't think of this as a replacement for a RAND, a quick RAND, because you can do like that XR shift is going to be a lot less cycles. Right? The XR shift is going to be like 10 or 15, 16 cycles, something like that. Um, very low. And uh, so this is going to be way more expensive. But the RD RAND or RD seed part of it, uh, we could use that to seed the random number generator for each work group. That would be a good use of it, right? Um, so, you know, that's, uh, that's what I would recommend. And we could easily do that. Uh, the question is, do we really care enough to bother? And then it's dependent on RD RANDs and blah, 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 but we could, right? And, and it would be fine. Uh, pseudonym 73 good to see you pseudonym 73 i think with our new stream time we never get to see you again but it's good to see you good day long time no stream low discrepancy signals do exhibit blue noise behaviors you do them right yeah like i mean that's my understanding anyway was that that's what you were low discrepancy sequences were trying to basically approach blue noise but you know i don't know how good they actually are but their main advantage he, he says is that you can access the quasi random streams in an arbitrary order not really relevant yet also, you can do better than two, three halt. And uh, yeah, like, so for progressive, progressive refinement is kind of probably where they are most useful in that way, right? Like you can kind of go like, okay, I could just kind of, yeah, I mean, I, the way we're doing the rates right now, I don't know that we care too much about that stuff, but in theory, we might. Do shader languages expose things like conditional assign? Um, it's actually more that they already just do it automatically. So um, 
if you take a look at the way that I wrote this, right, uh, conditional assign is what a shader normally does. So in say you, in GLSL and you do A equals B in GLSL, that's already conditional assign. Lane mask is, you know, in the shader you'll do something like if um, A is less than B, A equals B, that's actually in the shader compiler directly translated into um, this. So they're all, like, the entire shader thing is all conditional assigns. There's really no such thing as an unconditional assign in the shader, really. I mean, sort of there is in the sense that if you haven't done any predication yet, then it doesn't need to be conditional, but it, they're all mask, masked lane operations because shaders always operate n-wide. Um, they're usually 16-wide or 32-wide. Uh, so you're never in a situation where you're performing an assignment that is not masked per lane, uh, if that makes sense. All right, no more cues, so I will go ahead and shut down. Let me make sure that was okay. That was all okay, right? Uh, and this all got set properly, it looks like, right? Everything happy there. Yeah. Just wait for this guy to finish. Build is set to optimize still, right? Everything is right here. Let's just wait for that to terminate rather than killing it. No real reason to kill it. Uh, there we go. And we'll delete test bitmap since we don't need it. There's our output for the day. And it's all good. Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Ray today. And thank you for testing the stream. I'm going to end the stream now. And I'm going to go, uh, just after I stop the recording, I'm going to go talk to the folks to make sure there were no bugs in the video. Uh, but thanks for joining me. If you want to follow along with Handmade Ray, actually, uh, you can pre-order Handmade Hero. Handmade Ray, the source code to Handmade Ray comes with Handmade Hero, uh, and it's updated anytime I update Handmade Hero. So this weekend, there won't be an update to Handmade Ray, but next weekend when I update Handmade Hero, all the source codes will get pushed at that time. Um, so that's about it. Uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Until then, have, until uh, tomorrow when we'll finish up that optimization. Uh, have fun programming, and I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.